Honorable Deputy Minister of Culture, Dr. Cassianidou, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the seventh hybrid public lecture of the 60th public lecture series of the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus. Before introducing our today's speaker, Akin Kozal, Professor of Proto-History and Near Eastern Archaeology at Chanakale Onse Kismat University, I would like to share with you some sad news for us at the ARU and the University of Cyprus. <clears throat> Petros Floridis, Professor Emeritus at Trinity College, Dublin, passed away last week at Athens. Born in 1937 in his beloved Lapithos under the shadow of the Pendalachtlos on the north coast of Cyprus, Professor Floridis was a mathematical physicist educated at the University of London and Royal Holloway, a postdoctoral fellow at, Dublin, at the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies, a professor and fellow emeritus in pure and applied mathematics at Trinity College Dublin, a senior fellow and pro-chancellor at the same institution, a life member of the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and a patron of the Irish Hellenic Society. Above all, he was a man of numerous qualities with a deep knowledge and appreciation of, of, his, of Cypriot history and culture with strong bonds with his country and the University of Cyprus. Thus, this grief is institutional for numerous reasons. This grave, uh, great man served as a member of the preparatory committee for the establishment of the University of Cyprus in 1988 to 1992, and as chairman of the selection committee of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at our institution in 1990 to 1996. Beyond fulfilling this vision for the establishment of the first and largest academic institution in Cyprus, we at the Archaeological Research Unit of, and the Department of History and Archaeology owe him deep gratitude for acting as a patron for many of our own children, that is, our uh, graduates in history and archaeology who chose Trinity College Dublin for their MA and doctoral studies. Our colleague at the Department of Classics, Professor Christine Morris, mentored many of our former students, while Petros Floridis, who acted as ambassador for Cypriots and non-Cypriots based in Cyprus, strengthened, in his own way, the links between the University of Cyprus and Trinity. <clears throat> Yorgos Papandoniou, currently assistant professor at Trinity College Dublin, Savas Neocleus, former researcher at the University of Cyprus and abroad, Margarita Kiprianou, innovation manager at Cyprus Seeds, Constantina Alexandrou, Christiana Kelepeshi, Sabina Hadjipadeli and others, including archaeology colleagues such as myself, in the context of my Erasmus research and personal visits in Dublin, saw Petrus Floridis as the closest friend and second father. He will always be remembered with love and, and admiration, for he was a man of the highest integrity, genuine politeness, open-heartedness, discreetness, and low profile, despite his numerous achievements in life, comprising an inspiring example to follow for people of his and younger generations. Now back to our invited speaker for today's public lecture, Dr. Ekin Kozal, completed um, uh, completed her undergraduate studies in archaeology at Ankara University in 1996 and her BA, uh, her MA, sorry, at Bilken University in 1999. She received her doctoral title in 2006 at Eberhard Karls University in Tübingen. During her studies, she was awarded the Bilken, Dea, Dea and Studia Troika fellowships. She has been teaching at the Department of Near Eastern Archaeology of Chanakale University since 2004. She is also Associate Researcher of the Near Eastern Archaeology Department of the University of Bern and had been a researcher at the Albert Ludwigs University Freiburg Department of Near Eastern Archaeology, having received an Alexander von Hubold Fellowship for uh, experienced researchers. Dr. Kozal also conducted research on archaeological, has conducted research on archaeological ceramics in the framework of various projects in Turkey, from the west coast and Troy to the Syrian border in Analak. Her expertise lies in the study of cultures and interactions in the south in the eastern Mediterranean in the, mid, in the Middle and Late Bronze Age. Her research in southern Turkey, namely Kilisetepe, Gözlükule, Tepe, Baha, Sikeli Huyuk, Kinet Huyuk, and Alalak, deals with local and imported pottery, focusing also on chronology. The circulation of materials and shared styles also comprise a strand of her research to investigate connections through changing and evolving political hegemonies uh, and social structures. And it is in this context that she has been working systematically on middle and late Cypriot imported pottery in Anatolia. Dr. Kozal's study on, on red lustres, well made wear from Kilisetepe, brought new insights into our understanding of its production processes from an Anatolian perspective. 
In addition, she has been collaborating with the geologist Mustafa Kibarolu on provenance studies and production technologies of different pottery types in Anatolia, bringing an interdisciplinary perspective to the overall picture. Dr. Kozal is the author of a book and editor of two volumes, in addition to numerous book chapters and journal articles on topics related to her ongoing research and research interests. Closing this introduction, I would like to kindly ask all our participants on Zoom to keep their cameras off and their microphones muted. Should you wish to address a question or comment to our speaker, feel free to use the chat button. You may also switch on your cameras after the end of the presentation to address your question directly to the speaker by raising your hand and unmuting your microphone. Professor Kozal, Segili Ekin, Hoshgeldin. We are thrilled you were able to be with us at the Area U lecture room tonight, and we very much look forward to hearing all about super silicon connections um, in the late Bronze Age. Thank you. Well, dear um, Deputy Minister of Culture, dear colleagues, dear friends and students, um, I would like to express my first my condolences for Petrus Floridas, and um, I would like to thank um, Professor Vienes for this um, introduction and express my gratitude to Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus for inviting me to present my research. It is an honor to be here. Today, I will talk about Cypriosilation connections in the late Bronze Age, based on my pottery studies at several sites on the eastern part of the south coast of Anatolia. Anatolia's role in the Eastern Mediterranean network of the Bronze Age is so far not satisfactorily investigated from the archaeological perspective. The study of Cypro-Anatolian connections in the late Bronze Age not only contributes to the understanding of the interaction between Cyprus and an opposite coastal region in close vicinity, but also provides complementary and comparative evidence for the overall analysis of the interconnections in the Eastern Mediterranean from a wider perspective. The study of interregional relations proves itself to be complex due to various components. First component is the impact of the historical, political, socioeconomic background and mechanisms in Anatolia that led to the start, continuation, and the end of the Super Anatolian connections in the late Bronze Age. In this context, variations in the nature of connections in relation with the ge geopolitical regionalism in Anatolia will be one of the focal aspects of this lecture today. The second component that causes complexity to the analysis is the nature of the pottery as evidence. Cypriot pottery was obviously not the primary material to be imported. It had apparently a secondary functional significance Next to, next to valuable raw materials, for example, metals and textiles. Oliver and shipwreck, which gives insight about a cargo transfer in the Eastern Mediterranean at the end of the 14th century, was carrying circa 11 tons of metals as opposed to circa 130 vessels from Cyprus. Although it represents only one instance, the cargo clearly demonstrates that looking at only, only at imported pottery, it is impossible to reconstruct the main story behind it. As metals and other raw materials were used and recycled through time, the main evidence is generally lost. And as archaeologists, we are le usually left with pottery fragments to reconstruct the concepts of the interregional connectivity. The third component of the complexity is related to the understanding of the distribution mechanisms that involves also the land and the sea routes. Even though we observe regional patterns, there is still not enough evidence to examine whether the distribution was carried by central authorities or by some particular size, and whether the geopolitical background also affected the choice of the trade routes. In reconstructing the con uh, connections, typological, chronological, and spatial distribution of middle and late Cypriot pottery, 
as well as red lustrous wilmid ware in Anatolia are considered as the essential keys given their abundant appearance in, in Silesia. I will focus on two types of evidence that reflect two distinctive regional patterns. On one hand, I will report about the presence of middle and late Cypriot pottery in Plain Silesia, where red lustrous wilmid ware is very rare. On the other hand, I will review rough Silesia as the possible production center of red lustrous wilmid ware, uh, where in contrast, very few late Cypriot pottery was found. Before moving on to this subject, I would like to give a summary of the past and ongoing research in Silesia. Silesia is a geopolitical name of the Hellenistic and Roman periods. As the name Silesia didn't exist in the late Bronze Age, its later borders should also not necessarily reflect the late Bronze Age regional borders. Despite this fact, Silesia was established as a geographical term in archaeology, referring to the coastal region and the plain located south of the Taurus Mountains, representing the eastern half of the southern Anatolian coast in all periods, even in prehistoric times. Silesia is historically divided into two geographical areas. The eastern part is dominated by two plains and is called the Plain Silesia, translated from Kilikia Pedias in ancient Greek. The western part is the mountainous part and is therefore called Rough Silesia, translated from Kilikia Traheia, again in ancient Greek. The Limona River, which is the ancient Lamos, was the border between the two parts, not only in later periods, but also in late Bronze Age, as it is also a geographical, a very clear geographical boundary. The first archaeological survey in Silesia was carried out in 1931 by Swedish archaeologist Einar Gestad and published in 1934. Gestad examined a large area covering the rough and plain Silesia. His discovery of painted ceramics, including Mycenaean wares, and the publication of these wares with illustration attracted scholars to this region. At the same time, Adi Rizayalgon, the new director of the Adana Archaeological Museum, conducted intensive ethnographic research in Silesia. During his travels, he accidentally discovered Hittite reliefs, which together with Mycenaean pottery made Silesia more interesting to archaeologists. The first excavations began in 1935 by Hetty Goldman at Gözlükule after a survey season in 1934 and in 1936 at various sites by John Garstang, including Sirkilihuk. In 1938, Garstang decided to concentrate on Yumuk Tepe and left the other excavations. In the 1950s, the final reports from Gözlükule and Yumuk Tepe were published. Since then, these publications have become the main reference works for the Bronze Age in Silesia. It should also be mentioned that in addition to archaeological work, Hans Gustav Güterbock, who was teaching at the University of Ankara at the time, documented the relief of Muvattali II, uh, Muvattali II and published the first reading of the Slovian hieroglyphic inscription in 1938. This represents one of the earliest studies of this language and writing. In the 1930s, Veronica Seton Williams conducted a detailed survey of the plains of Silesia. Unfortunately, although her results were widely used, her work, her work does not provide a reliable birth basis in terms of chronology because she presented the ceramics without illustrations. Certain ceramic layers identified by her in Circulary, for example, were not found in our excavations there covering 15 seasons. From the 1990s onwards, new projects were initiated in Silesia. In rough Silesia, Kilisetepe, in plain Silesia, Soli, Yumuktepe, Gözlükule, Tepeva, Sirkelihöyük, Tatarlihöyük, and Kinetöyük. All of these projects yielded substantial remains of late Bronze Age along with Middle Bronze Age. As such, 
This new phase of excavations in Silesia became crucial in the analysis of connectivity. As the projects developed, it became necessary to study Silesia on a regional basis, which also resulted in the need to create a regional chronology. Here, a regional comparative stratigraphic and chronological sequence from the Neolithic to the Middle Ages was reconstructed by the Silesian Chronology Group, including all excavated sites, redefining the conventional periods with the original designation Silesian. Accordingly, the Middle Bronze Age was renamed as Old Silesian and the Late Bronze Age as Middle Silesian with subbases. This is a challenging work, still in progress. So coming back to our um, focus, so the first appearance of Cypriot pottery in Silesia dates to third millennium. Fragments of red on white and red black strip burnish ware vessels from Gözlükule in Plain Silesia have been published by Mahdat Meling. Moreover, a red polished jablet, jablet from Kilisa Tepe in Rath Silesia was discovered in the early Bronze Age level and published by Dorit Simonton. The connections continues into the early second millennium. The earliest mention of Alasia in Anatolian text as a geographical name is recorded in the text of the old Assyrian Sargon legend from Kanesh level two, dating to the beginning of the second millennium. <clears throat> Contemporary, with the earliest mention of Alasia, Cypriot white painted bears also appear in Kanesh. A white painted, pen, uh, white painted pendant line style jug was published by Paul Ostrom, and another white painted vessel was found in the vicinity of Kanesh. Silesia must have played a significant role in the connectivity between Alasia and Kanesh. As white painted bears and bichrome are also evident in Silesia. Here are some examples from Sirkeli Hoop. That were discovered in a monumental building dating to Middle Bronze II, along with a red polished jug. Similarly, white painted ware was also found at Tatar Hoop in building A dating to Middle Bronze II, which is also a monumental structure. In addition to Sirkeli and Tatarda, Kinet Hoyuk and Gözlükule as well, as well as a survey site, yielded further red on black vessels. <clears throat> Here are different types of red on black from Sirkeli Hoyuk. The appearance of Cypriot pottery in the Lake Bronze Age Seleucia can be reviewed best by the site of Kinetoik. Given its uninterrupted sequence from Middle Bronze to the end of the Lake Bronze Age. Located in most eastern Seleucia, Kinetvik is a town with, with, with its harbors, a citadel, and a local town. The earliest Cypriot pottery was found in the Middle Bronze II building, which is destroyed by an intense fire. Although the building is only partially excavated, it is possibly a palace building as Muratakar's architectural comparison with the contemporary uh, palace of Alala is quite convincing. Late Bronze 1 and 2 bears are also represented, uh, also the levels were represented by subsequent buildings from levels 15 to 13. A variety of Cypriot bears are represented in these levels, which are white painted, bichrome, red on black, black lustrous, monochrome, 
base ring white slip one and two, as well as white shaped. Um, here um, are um, yeah, additional examples uh, of the um, pottery from Kinetburg. The appearance of Cypriot pottery at Kinet shows a chronological pattern. Red and black, white painted, and bichrome wares are represented in the Middle Bronze II and Late Bronze I levels, whereas White Slip II is found in the Late Bronze II levels as opposed to White Shape, which was found only in period 13, which is the latest level of Late Bronze II. Monochrome and base ring are rather long living wares that were represented in all levels in discussion. However, monochrome stands out as it is the most common wear outnumbering white slip 2 in periods 14 and 13. Here is an example of monochrome with a complete profile. And here are further examples with different shapes and rim types. Is the common appearance of monochrome a coincidence or could have, a, could have some implications? The common, nature, the common nature of monochrome is reflected in other sites in plain solution. A complete example of monochrome was also found in Gözlükülü. Located next to Seyhan River, Tepeba uh, is very close to the bridge, dating back to the time of Roman Emperor Hadrian. Today, it still connects the opposite sides of the river. As put forward by means of the textual evidence in the Tapuno Imperi Byzantini, it was possible to navigate up to Adana, not only in the early Byzantine period, but also until the last century. Excavations in the late Bronze Age levels yielded numerous monochrome vessels of different types. Together with white slip one and two that distributed chronologically in successive eight phases. David Frankel's mapping of monochrome wear on Cyprus, taking Ostrom's work as reference, shows that monochrome has a concentration in Eastern Cyprus. This result accords well with our archaeometric analysis carried out on the monochrome from Alalah. Alalah yielded large amounts of late Cypriot pottery. Monochrome was the most common Cypriot ware in late bronze one, that was outnumbered by white slip two in late bronze two. Geochemical and pedographical analysis by Sinan Pedro Spanolo. Mustafa Kibarola and others put forward that monochrome and mites of clays were different from each other. However, the monochrome samples of Alala do match well with the published Calopsila clay and one Flamodi clay, pointing again towards eastern Cyprus, where significant second millennium centers of Calopsita and Enkomi located besides others. Monochrome being the most common bear, does this indicate that the connections with Eastern Cyprus were more intense than the other regions of Cyprus? Come back to Cilicia, I would like to summarize the results from Plain Cilicia before moving on to Rough Cilicia. And here we see a continuous appearance of um, Cypriot pottery from the Middle Bronze II until the end of Late Bronze II and in Plain Slocia. And we have um, very little amount of red lustrous in general in Plain Slocia. And in the Middle Bronze II, the connections that go beyond the Taurus Mountains um, until that reach out to Kanesh and in the Middle Bronze too, the use of sea and land routes are evident. Whereas in the Late Bronze 1 and 2, um, presence of Cypriot pottery is confined only to the south of Taurus Mountains 
and we see uh, as evidence the only use of sea routes. And the, here we see on the right column the political background that uh, in the Middle Grand Stew, there is an intensive trade network between Sura Mesopotamian regions and Anatolia through land routes. And late Bronze Age, the geopolitical background changes drastically when the kingdom of Kizibatna uh, and also after the Hatti Empire uh, kingdom, of course, uh, was founded with its own lineage of kings. Uh, the foundation dates to 1500 and lasted um, until 1400 or 1350 when it fell under, under the hegemony of Hatti. The connection um, between Alasia and Hatti took possibly mainly via rough Silesia in LB1 and 2, but plain Silesia might be integrated in the LB2 under the rule of Hatti. But um, I will come to this point. This is just a um, preliminary um, summary that I will discuss this point at the very end uh, once more. Kizibotna, um, being independent in the 15th century and 14th centuries, Kizibotna becomes um, later, Kizibotna becomes part of Hatti during the 14th century. Kizibotna came under the rule of Hatti around the reigns of Tatalia I and Shukdurima I reflecting a major political shift. The text of Madhuvatta, reporting a change in the status quo of Alasya, is approximately contemporary. It is, however, not clear whether these changes are connected. In the late Bronze too, there is a common feature appearing different sites, both in plain and rough Silesia, reflecting the rule of Hatti here in this region. This is the appearance of Lovian hieroglyphic seals, possibly of high officials and princes, who are evidently the same um, prince recorded as witnesses in different treaties concerning the borders um, of the southern part of Hatti. In addition to a prince seal, there is also a seal impression of Queen Pudihepa from Gesnukuya. So far, <coughs> not a single late Cypriot pottery was discovered in central Anatolia. The connections are only evident in the archives that mention the sending of goods to Hatti from Alasia that are mainly gold, copper, and bronze that have low visibility in archaeological reports. However, there is one quarter of a copper ingot and a gold object found at Hittite size that are most um, probably came from Cyprus. Inland Anatolia's connection to the Mediterranean Sea was obviously to rough Lucia, shown by the distribution pattern of red lustrous will made ware. Red lustrous will made ware has a very distinctive appearance that is characterized by its shiny polished red color, certain shapes, possibly particular content, and one main provenance. As such, it is easily distinguishable from other pottery types and therefore represents a particular style that must have functioned as a trademark to specialized production. As a result, it must have been a well-known product for its distributor and its end user in its distribution area that covers Central Anatolia, Rough Lucia, Plains Lucia, Cyprus, the Levant, and Egypt. In the previous research, red lustrous wool made ware was considered as an assemblage, taking only its wear into consideration. Here we see the forms of red lustrous grouped together by Paul Ostrom 
that are found on Cyprus. However, such a classification only in terms of where is not satisfactory enough, as it is self-evident that each form has a different function. So far, Dick Milke has examined three shapes of red lustrous from this functional perspective, demonstrating that spindle bottle was the most common shape outside Anatolia, as the other two shapes have a different distribution pattern and chronology. It's obvious that each form has its own function and its own story. As a result, red lustrous wear should be disentangled and each group should be considered separately. The production of these three shapes as slender and narrow forms must have been intentional as it would, much more it would be much more practical to transport them in baskets through land route and on ship through the sea route. Ericsson's table showing the chronological distribution of the wear in Cyprus also displays the variations among the shapes, telling us that we are dealing here with different types occurring at different times. For instance, spindle bottle is the most common shape, occurring earliest among others. The function of arm-shaped vessels are so far not well understood. It is likely that arm-shaped vessels could be related to the Anatolian seated deity who is holding a cup in the outstretched hand. Catherine Erickson's research and arguments favoring Cyprus as the origin of the bear are no longer compatible with the new evidence derived from excavations in Anatolia conducted in the last decades. Erickson's questions were valid questions, however, they were not complete. One important aspect remained in her research untackled. She did not take the shapes into consideration in identifying the origin of the wear. This crucial question is whether red lustrous typologically is embedded in the Cypriot or the Anatolian pottery tradition. To answer this question, the shapes of red lustrous correspond to the Hittite shapes shown in red here in the middle Hittite period. And also in the imperial period shown here in red. Red lustrous, again shown in red, even corresponds to earlier Middle Bronze Age and Old Hittite pottery from Anatolia. So that it becomes evident that red lustrous shape show a development from older Anatolian pottery traditions rather than Cypriot traditions. New results were collected from Boasco, Kushaklı, Kilise Tepe, and Kinetik. Did Mirke's chronological analysis of the wear from Kushaklı and from other Hittite centers demonstrate that the appearance of red lustrous can be dated as early as the Hittite Middle Kingdom. As such, Cyprus no longer represents the earliest appearance of the bear. Similarly, kinetic excavations yielded red lustrous, although not in, much, uh, not in large amounts, uh, from period 15 that belongs to the beginning of Lake Burns 1 period. The evidence from Bosco comes from the small sounding in one of the corners of the southern poles. The amount of fragments from this context is so immense that it is not possible to argue further that the largest quantities are on Cyprus. Examples of arm shaped vessels from the same context fragments of spindle bottles. Now arriving to the most interesting site of Kilisetepe when it comes to red lustrous. Located circa 50 kilometers inland from the Mediterranean Sea, along the Göksu River, that provides access through the Taurus Mountains between the coast and the inland. Here on the right is a crate of red lustrous fragments which is 
found in one excavation unit. Here, red lustris is found in every assemblage together with other rares, demonstrating its local nature. In Kirisadepa, late Bronze Age levels were represented by two chronologically distinctive administrative buildings. Northwest building dates to late Bronze I, whereas the Steely building is partially built on it with a different orientation in the following late Bronze II level. In Kirisadepa, all previously known forms of red lustrous are represented. Moreover, there are other new forms that are not observed at any other site so far. This shows that this location, possibly as a region, was the production center of the sphere. In Kirisetepe, there are three variations of red lustrous factory that is already observed also by Carl Lappert. These are fine, semi-fine, and coarse red lustrous. They are used for all local shapes, including pitoy, which are produced from both red lustrous and other fabrics. This is that is represented by the main, by the standard light brown layer. Mustafa Kibarola's chemical and pedographic analysis showed that these variations in fabric um, uh, belong to the same play. Additionally, Kibarov's comparative analysis of the new identified forms with the already known forms point to identical clay source that matches the soil and geological structure of La Lucia. There is also a technical feature that is also unique to Kirisetepe. This is the use of fine and semi-fine red lustrous fabric in one vessel. Here is the vessel and the um, a handle are produced from um, two vari variations of the fabric in one vessel. This fragment is also made of semi-fine fabric and coated with a layer of fine red lustrous. In Kirisetepe, there are also figurines made of red lustrous fabric. The tradition of using red fabric and light brown fabrics in Anatolia goes back to the early Bronze Age as the study of Elif Ünlü on the material from Tarsus Pesukle shows. As a result, it is highly probable that red lustrous, red lustrous is a further developed version of this red fabric tradition of Anatolia, well known since the early Bronze Age. Putting all this evidence together, Ralph's Lucia, shown here in yellow, is the most likely source and the production region of red lustrous, from which it was distributed to central Anatolia and other parts of the eastern Mediterranean. The majority of the red, of red lustrous in circulation is produced from the fine version, which indicates an intentional marketing strategy of the wear. It has been argued by Ali Dinchol and his colleagues that Ralph's Lucia partially belonged to Ura, a historical region mentioned in the textual evidence as a region and a harbor town with its merchants who were acting both privately and also on behalf of the Hittite court. If red lustrous couldn't be correlated with historical Ura is still an open question. Conclude. There was a flow of Cypriot pottery to Plains Lucia and also beyond the Taurus Mountains to Kanish in the Middle Bronze II when the city states of central Anatolia were possibly uniting under the rule of Anita, Con Anita Concuri. The mention of Alasia in a text from Kanish is coherent with the pottery evidence. In the Middle Bronze Age, there is no Cypriot pottery found in rough Lucia. White painted wares are the most common in Plains Lucia, 
that were also accompanied by red on black. Late Bronze One is a period witnessing the emergence of kingdoms of Kati, Kizuwatna, and Azawa on Anatolian ground. Late Cypriot wares such as monochrome, white slip one and white slip two, base ring are imported to plain Silesia, continuing without an interruption from the Middle Bronze Age. However, in Late Bronze One, so far, Late Cypriot pottery was not discovered in Hatti or in Rapsvesia, which was obviously politically affiliated with Hatti. In the late Bronze I period, red luster squill made ware was apparently transported from rough Slusia to Cyprus. As such, an anti clockwise circular movement between Anatolian Salkos and Cyprus that may be related with the currents and winds that favor navigations in these di directions can be observed. It could also be possible that a ship departing from rough Silesia and downloading the cargo in Cyprus could travel back to plain Silesia with a new uploaded cargo from Cyprus. In Lake Brands 2, when Plain Silesia became part of Kati, the relations between um, Cyprus and Silesia continue from Lake Bronze I without any alterations. The connections between Hati and Alasia are well documented in the text. However, it is not possible to say whether the connections took place via plain or rough slushia or both. As I said before, Red Lust responds to a connection between um, central Anatolia and Cyprus through rough slushia, but actually it doesn't exclude plain slushia as another possibility. The connections between Cyprus and Anatolian South Coast is certainly interconnected with broader historical and archaeological perspective of the Eastern Mediterranean, which could not be dealt here. However, I hope that I could give an overview of Cypriot Silesian connections. I had to leave out some aspects and the de uh, details in order to not to exceed the time, but I will be happy to answer any questions. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we are deeply grateful, not only for making the trip all the way to Cyprus just for this evening, but also because you are giving a, a really helpful hand to the mysteries between Silesia and Cyprus. And I think we have to tell everybody that uh, you were one of the main organizers of the Bern conference last May, which for the first time brought together so many scholars from Cyprus and Silesia. And I, I believe it was one of the most lively and productive meetings we've had in a long time. So thank you again. And let's open the floor for comments and questions. I'm sure there are many challenging ones because your talk was equally challenging. <laughs> Do we have questions from the 